Hello, and welcome to all of you watching this. This interview is part of the series I'm doing to publicize the 2023 conference of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. The conference is called SciCon, and it'll take place in Las Vegas from October 26th through the 29th. That's just two months away. Uh, if you're watching this video soon after it's published, our fare is at a low point, at least from my area to Vegas. I booked a flight a few months ago, and uh, I didn't get the best rate. So live and mm -hmm. learn. Uh, today's guest is psychologist Stuart Weiss. Welcome, Stuart, and thanks for doing this with me. I'm happy to be here, Rob. Nice, nice to have a conversation with you. So this is what it has to say about you on the SciCon 2023 speaker site. Stuart Weiss is a psychologist and author who, since November 2022, has served as the interim editor for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, where he also writes its behavior and belief column. Short and sweet. That's all it says. <laughs> well, I'll add that uh, in your most recent Skeptical Inquirer article uh, for your column, Behavior and Belief, uh, and it was published just a few days ago, and it was named Mental Illness and the Tragedy of Good Intentions. And I, I just read that. That was that's quite fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. So would, mm -hmm. I've enjoyed writing that column quite a bit and I'm happy to get I, more time to do so now. How how long have you been writing it? Oh gosh, I think it's been seven or eight years now. It's been quite a while. It was like uh um and and I've I've just really loved it. I it you know, I I I have great freedom as to what topics I get to choose. I love writing about psychology, but also in a skeptical vein with uh, where where common ideas about human behavior might not turn out to be true. And uh, and so it's it's been great. I've, I've really enjoyed it. So because that's such a short intro on the site, let me also tell some people what uh, Wikipedia adds. You have a, quite an extensive Wikipedia article. It says that you specialize in belief and superstitions and critical thinking and is frequently an invited speaker for media uh, as an expert on superstitious behavior. Vice holds fellowships in two organizations, the Association for Psychological Science and the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which runs this conference, where he's also on the CSI Executive Council. Uh, Vice is also a contributor to a website dedicated to educating parents and others about the scientifically discredited concept called facilitated communications. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed that the wiki article on you, uh, and on the magazine, by the way, are, are out of date regarding your work at Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, not noted in the article is that you've been uh, print magazine's interim editor since the passing of Kendrick Fraser. Right. It, it's true. And and uh, even the description for SciCon is a little out of date because I, I have completed my term uh, as interim editor of Skeptical Inquirer and have passed it on to the able hands of Stephen Hupp, who I think will be a terrific, um, you know, person to to edit the magazine uh, following Ken's illustrious and long career. Um, so, so, but I did, I did have, you know, in at SciCon in November, we heard word that Ken Frazier, the longtime editor of the magazine was ill. And it was shortly after we all came home that he passed and, uh, and I had no idea, but it made a big change in my life uh, for a short period of time, for the, for about eight or nine months. Uh, and uh, I was uh, happy to fill in. Uh, it's I, I think that it's in better hands going forward with Stephen Hupp, but um, but uh, it, it was quite an experience, and I I feel happy that I was able to keep the magazine at a high level that I think Ken would have been proud of and uh, and and get those issues out. It's a great staff. It's not just me. I wouldn't have been able to do it without a tremendous staff that was still in place. So how did you wind up taking that on? Did you have any prior editing experience for magazines or elsewhere? Not really. Uh, I mean, I ha actually had a history of turning down editing jobs. I actually like to write my own words rather than edit other people's words, uh, mostly. Uh, but uh, it, uh, I was asked, I mean, Barry, Barry asked me, it's funny, when we were at the conference, I came up to him and said, you know, as we had learned that Ken was ill uh, and that it might be serious. And I offered some ideas about what we might do going forward with the magazine, none of them involving me, right? 
Uh, and he's he's he said, even in that moment, he said, are you talking to me because you'd be interested? And I said, no. And and it was only after they came back and and asked me again to do it just as an interim basis. But I think I guess, you know, they had seen my work for such a long time. I already had a relationship with uh, Julie LaVarnway, who is the editor and and uh, and some other people on the staff. I think that it was a natural thing that I might step in. Plus, you opened your mouth. I have noticed in my, in my field, engineering, if you do that in the office about anything, it's like, oh, that's a good idea. Rob, why don't you do it? I know. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's sort of what happened. But I also am honored that they trusted me with it. Yeah, you know, this is not a small thing. It is an Absolutely. enormously important magazine. And, uh, and so that's why w once I realized that I could do it at least just as an interim, and it became very clear to me after I started working at it that it wasn't, although I thought I did a pretty good job and I I was ha happy to help out, it wasn't a job I wanted long term. And so uh, so Stephen, I think, is going to be terrific. And uh, and I'm, I'm glad to have bridged the gap between Ken and Stephen. I interviewed him. Uh, uh, I was uh, going to interview him because he's speaking at SciCon anyway. Right. And then when that happened, uh, that he it was announced he was going to be the new editor, I kind of changed the thrust of our interview, and we talked a lot about that. So at the time I talked to him months ago, he, uh, the transition had just started. So is that complete now? Yes, pretty much so. Uh, you know, I August first was the the official transition date. Uh, you know, I have had a few little strings that I've had to deal with since then. But he is now fully on board, and uh, and and it was nice that it happened in a way over the summer. I think, uh, even though people were traveling and things, uh, he was able to ease into it, and I worked with him extensively through July, uh, and so I think he I think he's made a very good transition, and uh, and so so I am now back to just just being. Uh, you know, a behavior and belief columnist for the magazine, which which is a very comfortable position for me to be in. And and of course, you're uh, involved with the organization in other ways. You recently uh, gave a Skeptical Inquirer Presents talk, and uh, and we're here to talk about your PsyCon talk. So let's do that. So it's titled "Start Making Sense." You're scheduled for Friday at nine a.m. I think it's nine a.m. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Five p.m. Um, and here's their official description. You overhear people on the street and you want to say, and it's a French phrase, and I'm not going to try to repeat that because I don't speak French, but it translates to what is that, I think, yeah. and run, run, run away. Even more disturbing, they overhear you and want to do the same. Could you both be right? If reason is our most powerful tool for staying alive and achieving fulfillment, why is it so hard to use? And why is there so little agreement about what it is? Psychologists do advice a sometimes talking head, but never a psycho killer, will describe the science behind many of our common irrationalities and offer suggestions that will help you start making sense. It sounds like a fascinating talk, but you have to explain the psycho killer line. Did you write that? <laughs> yeah, so so I did write that. So, um, uh, you, you know, you have to be a fan of the, of the rock group, the talking heads, to be able to decode that whole thing. Ah. So they, yeah. they have a song uh, over my head called yeah, Psycho uh, Killer. And and uh, and they also have a song that begins with, you know, the whole thing. And you say, qu'est-ce que c'est? And uh, so all of that, all of that is just sort of, you know, fluff uh, that I stole from the talking heads. And, okay. and, and they have a they have a famous album called Stop Making Sense. So that's why the title of the talk is Start Making Sense. So. Okay, that is going to all sound beautiful to fans of that rock group. And I, I right, maybe I'll understand. play this some music during the during the presentation. Really uh, an idea, yeah. Yeah. But, all right, so what else would you like to say about your talk? What well, I mean, so this is one of those things. I mean, I, first of all, I wrote that description and 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 submitted it to Barry Carr, who you know runs the conference, and and he of course recognized the musical thing, and for whatever reason, he accepted this this highly uh, not very descriptive uh, description of the talk. So, uh, you know, I. Uh, I uh, and this is one of those situations where 
where you know you're asked many months in advance to write a description of a talk that you're not going to sit down and prepare for you know a long time and so i try to keep it wide wide open i i think that i will i mean i have some ideas about what i'll do um uh it barry likes to start the day this would be the first talk of the day people will be you know probably still asleep drinking their coffee uh and so uh, he said he likes to have somebody with, you know, a psychologist sort of give an overview of some broad ideas in the morning. And so I think I can do that. And I probably will will talk, you know, about um, different kinds of people with respect to their degree of rationality, you know, uh, people who are uh, true believers in superstition and irrational stuff uh versus people who sort of fall in the middle and are you know know it's crazy but they still sort of believe uh and then of course the 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 rationalists and skeptics and so forth and how how do we get along how do we maneuver maneuver amongst ourselves in a productive way and uh so in in general terms that's probably what i will talk about on the day oh that sounds fascinating okay um what well, what do you think about cults? Have you written on that subject? Is that something that's ever... Uh, I've read a, some about it. I haven't written too much about cults. Uh, you know, I, I they are troubling and uh, and they do, they have some common features uh, in terms of uh, people being cut off from the outside world and getting all of their information from within the within the group. Uh, and uh, you know tests of loyalty and so forth. So uh, I mean, it's a, it, 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 I'm not, I'm curious as to why the question comes up for you. Well, so actually, just a timing thing. Literally five minutes before I was supposed to start this, I started a YouTube video which was recommended, and it was some someone uh, talking about a new poll that was just released. Uh, I wrote some stuff down. A recent poll of likely Trump voters. The question was, where do you feel you get information that is true? And the four predominant answers were religious figures, 42%, the conservative media, 56%, friends and family, 63%, and Donald Trump, 71%. Yeah. So, I mean, that is scary that one person overrides their friends, their family, anything else they see, even in the media they believe and their religious figures. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, like when the world going in this direction, or at least America, like how do we get people to think rationally? Well, that's that's it's tough. The uh, you know, this is, um, you know, the, so the now I see the connection and I did see that poll this morning as well and pretty shocking. And um, and, you know, it, it, it's one of those situations where the you know dear leader is the leader. He, you know, and and there's a sense of obligation and, and allegiance to one person, regardless of what they do. I mean, Donald Trump has obviously, under normal circumstances, would have tested everyone's patience and moral, uh, you know, yardstick, uh, and and yet, you know, he he is for this group of people. Um, a, a, a someone that they adhere to just without thinking, literally without thinking, just yeah. just, uh, and so uh, it's a problem. And it, and unfortunately, I think it's a kind of thing that is becoming more popular, not just in the U.S. but but worldwide. And uh, and you know, your question of how we fight against it is is a huge one. Uh, I I I think we we need to talk about that. I'm not sure I'll be able to get, provide you with an answer for that in my Psycon talk, but. But it's certainly the kind of thing that's in the background, and and we do have to we do have to think about it. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's so scary. I mean, and like scientists and medical professionals weren't even in that list. It's just right. Like wow. Right. Well, we know they wouldn't be high, they wouldn't list higher than Trump probably. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, they weren't even fifth. Um, so, right. Yeah. So, what what got you interested in all of this psychology as a, I mean as a career path initially? Oh, well, interestingly, the, what started me, that's a good question, I, which people don't ask me very often. Uh, the um, the It started actually with autistic kids. Uh, uh, the the And this connects with the facilitated communication, which I hope you'll ask me about yes. later. Yeah, but we'll that, yeah. but uh, I started out, after, after getting out of college, I started out working at a school for autistic children. And 
And they used a very uh, organized behavioral strategy for for teaching skills to these kids who are, in this case, were very severe, uh, severely disabled. Many of them had no language at all and, and engaged in rough forms of behavior. Uh, and I saw that this stuff worked. You know, I was um, I was amazed at how over time the kids made progress, and I became interested in the theory behind it and wanting to go back to school in it. So, and then once I was in graduate school, I really just got involved in in the, a theory. I, I'm I'm a I'm a scientist. Uh, I call you know I'm one of those people who, although I, my degree is in psychology. I consider myself to be a behavioral scientist. I'm interested in the science of human behavior, uh, not so much helping other people. Although, although you know, I think it's really great that that some psychologists do do that. And uh, but I'm I'm interested in figuring out why we do the things we do, and that to me has become a lifelong interest and fascinating topic. Okay, yeah. So since you mentioned the facilitated communications, let's talk about that now. Um, I, I I read on Wikipedia that you're a contributor to a website dedicated to educating people about this subject. And um, I have seen tons of essay articles by you about this. Uh, for those not in the know, can you describe what facilitated communications is and why a psychologist would be interested in it? Sure. Uh, yeah, and uh, I do write about it a, a fair amount uh, in, in the magazine and elsewhere when it comes up. Um, the so so many many about thirty percent of of children with autism do not develop speech in in an, uh, in any real sense. They may have or they have very limited speech, and so. This is this is you know language is one of the defining features of of being a human and 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 so uh, for the parent of such a child uh, it's very difficult to accept this and and there are standard ways to teach how these kids how to communicate and the, and some limited progress can be made using various assistive devices and sign language what various methods but but for many parents that it appears that that wasn't adequate and so so they have been fooled by something called facilitated communication which in its original format was uh was a case where a, a keyboard, a computer keyboard, or some other kind of keyboard device was set up in front of the child. A, an adult would hold the child's wrist and, you know, form the finger, and the kid would type on the keyboard, right? Well, or the, you know, it, it appeared that the child typed on the keyboard. Uh, in fact, unknown to the assistant, the facilitator who's helping, they're the ones who are doing the typing. And uh, and so you have the situation where parents and others believe, and teachers in some cases, believe that suddenly this child who's, who's never spent, said a word in their life, uh, never learned to write, never you know had all, any of the basic skills that we would have before we would be able to type out messages, is suddenly typing out uh, you know, very fluent messages, writing poetry, writing novels, and so forth. And so, and and what you know, I'm sure it's all again well-meaning, but uh, but what they don't realize is that in an Ouija board type fashion, uh, it is the language competent adult who is typing out the messages and not the child and that and it they are not able to to figure that out and uh and and it's a it's a shame i mean it, when you think about it uh, rather than helping the child speak since this this technique has no science behind it whatsoever every every single scientific test of it has shown that it doesn't work. That it is the it is the parent who's doing, and there have been many published over the years. Um, but uh, you know, rather than actually you know releasing some inner language, it's a case of the adult imposing on the child like a marionette uh, their own will and. And in that sense, it's a, something of a human rights violation and and a, and a tragedy. And uh, and so uh, and, and yet, you know, 
it's a difficult subject to, to approach that people are, are reject the idea that they're the one touch typing it out and they they want so much for their children to be you know, whole and intelligent and so forth so uh so it's been difficult and and we thought back in the 90s that it had been beaten back and that that's when most of the studies were done we thought it was gone uh, but it's come raring, roaring back in various variations. They don't use the word facilitated commission, communication as much anymore, although they do on occasion. And so it's it's become quite quite a thing again. And so a number of us have band together. We we bought the domain name facilitatedcommunication.org. Uh, and and there's tons of really valuable information and and it's been helpful. I mean, uh, we we've attacked it on several fronts, and uh, and many parents who are not familiar with it, who have not bought into it yet, uh, have come to our website and learned some stuff. So so uh, it's a worthy project that that we continue to work on. So there was a talk a number of years ago, it's, I believe it was pre-pandemic, by Janice Boynton, who used to be a uh, facilitator and believed she was coming, you know, what was coming out was the words of the person she was facilitating. And then I think it was a legal proceeding that happened because what was coming out was the child was accusing somebody in the family of abusing them, right? I think that's the, the story here. And then that's right. she, she submitted to tests and it, and it was clear that, she subconsciously was coming up with these and and now you know she felt very bad about that she's now a speaker against facilitated communications very involved with trying to tell this to other people who have bought into it and believe it it's it's one of those very hard things to to convince people like if if they've been to a psychic medium and put in touch with their dead relatives and then right. the skeptic comes along and like tries to explain how they're being fooled by something that isn't really what they think it is they reject that and this is similar, I guess, a parent, you know, they get to communicate with their child when they couldn't before. And like, how dare the skeptics say, no, it's not true. Yeah, it it has a very similar, it's a good comparison because it has a very similar emotional component to it. You know, this is a situation where the parent has never heard the child say, I love you, you know, their entire lives. And suddenly they can say that and a lot more. And, and so it's, it is difficult. Yeah. Janice is, is uh is in some sense our leader she is she is also one of the people behind the website she's one of the main contributors of content to it she also has been doing some great little videos where people have put videos of facilitated communication on the web and she pulls out sections of those videos and does an analysis of them to show that they are not what they appear to be. So uh, uh, she's been she's been tremendous uh, and and a very inspiring turnaround in her belief system and and her project. It's a, yeah, it's a fascinating story when someone can can make that change, realize that they were wrong, and then not only just drop out but try to help convince other people of that. Right. No, she she's she's an amazing person, and I'm happy to call her a friend. So, do you know about the 2017 film Deej? Yes, I I don't know that I've actually seen it, but I know about it. Uh, and and there are on the website there's an analysis of it. Yeah, let, uh, let me read well. the the lead. The lead from the Wikipedia article is Deej is a 2017 documentary about David James DJ uh, Severies, Severies, a non-speaking autistic teenager with disabilities who is depicted as communicating through the scientifically discredited facilitated communications technique. The film's unskeptical depiction of facilitated communications include, including the claims that DJ's degrees from Oberlin College is legitimate and that he is the author of the film's script rather than it being created by his facilitator, have been the subject of criticism. So this is somebody who graduated from a college, has gone on to be claimed to have authored a film of which, you know, he's a central character. That, that's astounding to me if this is fake. Yeah, it is. And uh, and that's not alone. There, there are many, at this point now, there are quite a few people who have gone with their facilitators to college and have gra graduated with college degrees, even given valedictorian addresses. Now, how do they do that? The facilitator and the and the student record in advance the words typed out right in the thing, and then so the student just stands up at the podium at the graduation ceremony, presses a button, and the speech plays automatically. 
Um, and so uh, it's uh, it's it's really it's really something. It's gotten quite uh, involved, and it's of course very inspirational. Uh, there have been a number of books and movies like this one. Uh, but I will say this, you're reading from the Wikipedia page, and here is where the guerrilla skeptics of Wikipedia have been so, so valuable. This group has kept on top of, of facilitated communication. So, so another, you know, if they don't come to our website, they're probably going to go first to Wikipedia. And I think if you go to the Wikipedia page for facilitated communication, you'll find that it's a very accurate description of what it is and not not a, uh, a, a story of miraculous communication. And one of the other things that the guerrilla skeptics have, uh, I'll say brilliantly done, is Wikipedia has a system wherein within the Wikipedia search engine, if you type for a different term, you can have a redirect page. So mm -hmm. if you type in rapid prompting method, which is one of right. the terms it's called now, it'll go right to the facilitated communications page. Awesome. That's yeah. so great. Yeah, because that because that's what they've done. You know, they they've changed the method a little bit and they've changed the name, but they're all the same. And uh and so there are several now there are several names that are essentially the same thing. And so it's great that they redirect to to the one page. That's yeah. why we chose we chose the word facilitated communication as the name of our of our website because and yet we deal with all the other variations as well. But we wanted to make it clear to people that it may look a little different. It may have a different name, but it's exactly the same. And there's no science behind it. Like almost every organization dealing with people with these sorts of communication problems uh, disavow uh, facilitated communications, yet it's still, right. as you said, thriving. What, why is that? I mean, they they offer the moon. They offer the best reward, right? They, they, it's too good not to be true, and but it isn't true. And uh, and so, um, you know, that that is the reason. That, but you're right, the, all the professional organizations uh, many of them have statements against its use, including the American Speech Language Hearing Association, which should be the most important one of all. And uh, so, uh, you know, there I, I'm a member of a loose a group uh, of people, a cabal that is working against <laughs> communication, and and not it's an amazing. Cabals, not all cabals are bad people. Not that's all. right. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a good one, and and it's an amazingly diverse in terms of uh, of professional background. It's amazing we have a number of parents of of children with autism in the group who are also fighting against it. We have people from speech and hearing, psychology, uh, all sorts of different backgrounds. It's and, and lawyers. You know, it's it's been in a way it's been an interesting side uh, volunteer effort that I've been happy to be a part of. So if this is the first that a viewer here is hearing about this, how can they get in touch with that organization and, you know, help? Well, I mean, the 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 best thing would be to get it would be to go to our website uh, and we don't we're not fine. We're, we're actually financing all of this ourselves at this point. We're not where we have no mechanism for people to to uh, to, you know, donate or anything like that. We're not organized uh, in that sense. So. So, uh, but I would I would say just go to the website and educate yourself. Okay. So one other psychological topic I want to talk to, you, which is also an interest of mine, is Havana syndrome. Uh, you've written about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of my favorite topics. I've given uh, talks about it. Uh, your your February twenty two article is called "Mass Psychogenic Illness: The Unacceptable Diagnosis." Uh, have you written about on this uh, controversy before? And, and can you explain a little bit about it for people who may not be aware of this? Yeah, I I have not. That was a that was a new topic for me. Although it came up um, in, I mean, I so I I should just say that uh, as far as my career goes, I spent most of my uh, working life as a psychology professor uh, teaching. Uh, uh, undergraduate students primarily in psychology. And so, uh, you know, when you're teaching psychology and you're coming up with interesting things, lots of things come up that you, that you want to bring into the classroom because they're of interest. And one was many years ago, there was a, um, there, there was a 9-11 rash. This was actually written up in a New York Times magazine article many years ago. But at, following 9-11, if you recall, 
there were all these things like there was an anthrax scare. You know, th there was just a lot of free-floating anxiety for obvious reasons at that time. And and so there was a, an outbreak of what they what they later referred to as sort of 9-11 rash which, among schoolgirls. Uh, primary students at public schools in various places in the country, actually, uh, and uh, and they were and and it seemed to be mostly just girls, not boys, uh, and and you know the, it, there was a the parents got all upset. They thought it was something in the building. They thought it was all these different things, and it turned out to be a case of of mass psychogenic illness, where where the the girls were probably un, unconsciously scratching and creating, you know, uh, a rash and itching and so forth. Um, and they found that if they broke them up, you know, if they, if they separated them, you know, eventually it went away and stopped. And so, and, you know, it was always a question, even the administrators said, it was always a question like, why was it only, if it's an environmental thing, why is it only girls and not boys? And, you know, and so, so there, you know, it, it's, it was, that was a situation like Havana syndrome in the sense that it was caused psychologically, you know, doesn't, didn't mean that they didn't have a rash. They did, they had the symptoms, uh, but it also was not a message that people were going to receive very well, right? They didn't want to be told it's in your head, so to speak. And, uh, and Havana syndrome uh, is similar. And I, you know, one of the beauties of the writing this column for me is that if I'm interested in a topic, I get to read up on it and write about it. Right. So that's what I did in this case. I read the, the book, uh, by Bartholomew and Bleo and, uh, it, which was reads sort of like a novel. They cover the ground very well. And, uh, and so that's what I based that column on, but, but, you know, it's hard to tell people who are in service of the government, right, who's committed their lives to government, who are in stressful situations, that this is a psychological, a real physical symptom, but brought on psychologically. And, uh, and, and yet that is the primary hypothesis for this particular thing. Yeah, I actually did a, a book review in Skeptical Inquirer about that book, Havana Syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think I'll post a link in the text article for that, because it, it's such a fascinating you know, overview of it. I don't know how anyone could read that book and still believe that we we're being attacked by, you know, energy weapons. Uh, yeah. It's just yeah. the history of psychogenic illness is just so clear. And this in the Havana syndrome claims just to check all the boxes. It's it, it, it does. It's quite incredible. I am. Um, yeah. And so I really the, recommend that book. I, I was glad you re reviewed it because that means it got two shots in the uh, in the, the magazine or, or you know because i mentioned it in my column and you wrote the review i hope people will read it no yeah. well so how did you get involved with the skeptical movement uh, to begin with by the way well another good question uh so i am um, at some point in my early career i developed an interest in superstition uh and it actually you know uh, I was sort of a Skinnerian at the beginning of my career. I, I uh, 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 as a psychologist, um, you know, a follower of B.F. Skinner, not a slavish, cultish follower, but but uh, inspired by him. And uh, and uh, he had done an early experiment in super superstition in the pigeon, which was probably his most famous experiment. And uh, and I had also been influenced by some other work that people had done with humans. And I started to do some studies when I was a young researcher on, on creating sort of superstitious behavior in college students in the laboratory, you know, in a simple video game sort of situation where they would come up with crazy theories that weren't in fact true about how I, I would set them into a video game where I don't tell them how the points come, you know, and they had to figure it out. And they would, under certain circumstances, they would come up with crazy theories that were not at all accurate. Um, so, uh, so it just got me thinking about superstition, and I ended up writing a book. Uh, you know, my first book was called "Believing in Magic: The Psychology of Superstition." And as I was working on that book, a colleague of mine uh, had been my professor and later became a colleague and co-author, a guy named James Mulick. Uh, who, uh, who is at the University of uh, Ohio, Ohio State. And uh, 
he said, you know, you should read this magazine, Skeptical Inquirer, right? You, you would, you know, you would really like it. And I had no, I had no, you know, I, my topic was clearly consistent. Uh, and I had been sort of a rationalist my whole life, you know, in various ways. And so uh, I had never heard of it before. And I, before long, I started to, um, I subscribed to it, of course, and read it. And I, for many years after I published that book on superstition, I taught a course called Irrational Behavior. And I would assign uh, the Skeptical Inquirer to uh, the students and uh, and they would you, they would write papers and cite things in Skeptical Inquirer. So so that was that. And then, you know, was, but that was like happening. I was not involved at, at that point. And what happened was that at some point I was writing blogs for for um, uh, psych psychology today. And I wrote one about superstition and very, you know, emailed me and said well look if you ever want to write this kind of stuff for us you know come on over to our side and uh and it was a it was it was a fabulous offer and i immediately jumped on it because uh psychology today was not really doing it for me uh and skeptical inquire was so so that's it that's the beginning and uh and i have never regretted it for one minute uh it, it has i feel very much uh, at home in this group and and like what they're doing. So, all right. So let me get that straight. I'm going to summarize. You introduced many students to the Skeptical Inquirer and the universe through karma has given you the position of editor. <laughs> I think you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you know, it's just luck, but I have been lucky. The, have you seen the speakers list for this year's conference? Anyone you're yes. looking oh, forward yes. to yeah. maybe meeting for the first time? Uh, well, I mean, I, the, uh, I of course, I've never, met, I've never actually met Penn and Teller. That would be that would be pretty cool. I have met uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I have not. Uh, I'll tell you just personally, I, I have not been in the same room with Stephen Hupp before uh you know the new editor uh -huh. so so that is what i'm looking to that's one of the things i'm looking forward to the most i'm sure we'll have lots to talk about uh with our different backgrounds now both working having worked on the magazine uh so so uh, i'm very much looking forward to meeting him and that that will be probably the highlight of my my psycon are you staying for the entire thing you can attend the costume oh yeah party? I'm there for the duration. I'll be there for Sunday papers and everything. So yeah, I'm. I'm, well, I'm glad you mentioned that. So many, so many people don't realize like the true extent of what that is, and they leave early. They either leave, you know, Saturday night or Sunday morning, and they miss the Sunday paper. I've been involved with that myself, and uh, I write about it because I think it's such a great opportunity to see like six quick topics from mm. essentially you know non-famous people. But they're always very interesting because a committee, you know, uh, you have to apply and a committee narrows down the range of what they think is a great uh, topic. And, and they've always been great. Yeah, no, I, I very much enjoy it. It's a difficult thing for those of us that live on the East Coast. If you are trying to get home the same day, uh, then then, you know, you have to you, you sometimes you have to do a, a red eye or something like that. Uh, but uh, but I have actually booked a room to stay Sunday night. So ah, I'll, very good. I'll travel home on Monday. Uh, so so I'm I'm covered for the Sunday papers. Very good. That That's that's my uh, plan as well. So are you attending the costume party? Uh, no, <laughs> not gonna, not gonna, I will not gonna, say I will say this. Uh, you know, I am not a, I, I, there are two things. I'm not a conference goer in general. I don't, although I have done it many times. Uh, and I'm also, I have to say, just not into the whole costume thing. Uh, so I, I have, all the many years that I've been to PsyCon, I've never been to the Halloween party. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a stick in the mud about that. Uh, but so that, let me give you a li little tip here. A, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't do it. Either they don't want to pay the extra money for the events, or they also don't feel like being in costume or in a loud room because sometimes they're yeah. loud. But th where they hold it, there's a nice area right outside and people just gather. People come out, come out, you know, for uh -huh. a break and other people who don't have a ticket just hang outside with them and all talk. And I did well, that. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, maybe yeah. I will do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that yeah. Thank you for, thank you for that suggestion. It's not the money. It's clearly in my yeah. case that would make the difference, but, uh, 
but uh, it's just not, you know, that's not, I think yeah, I, will I, say, I, I will say that many people love Las Vegas. Uh, I am not one of them. And so, so I, so my measure, it's a measure of my love of this organization that I go there every year and, uh, and hang out with because I, you know, all the people I want to see and so forth. So my sense is that there's a little bit of history there, you know, over the years that the conference and on, and before that, the prior conference, uh, was there Randy's, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the amazing, amazing meeting. amazing meeting. And there's also that magic connection. Right. Yeah. That, that, you know, we, we it's a funny thing uh, you, when you join this group to learn that there are all these magicians who are a part of it. And and obviously, Randy was the with, was the greatest example of that. But there are many others as well. And Banachek, Banachek and, did a performance for us one year. Exactly. Piff, Piff the Magic Dragon, who's the house yes. up there. <laughs> the yes. And, no. So so I understand in a way why it's there. It's just a. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I will be there. I will love the whole conference, but uh, but there, you know, we all have to make some decisions. Okay, so last, are you on social media? How can people reach out to you if they want to? Yes, I am. Uh, for better, or for worse, I am. Uh, I have my own website, which is my name, StuartVise.com. So you can learn what I'm up to. I um, I'm on 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 the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. Now X, I don't know how that's going these days, but that's that. And uh, and I'm on Instagram. Uh, if anybody wants to follow me, I'm also on Facebook. So uh, I I uh, you know as I say, it's a it's a love hate relationship with all of those things. But uh, but for for now at least, I have them. I have my own theory on why uh, why Twitter was changed by Elon. So uh, are you aware of the of the um... Uh, let's see, I'll call it a movement to be nice. The birds are not real movement. Yes, yes. I am. Right. So, yeah, for people who don't know, this is a Poe conspiracy theory and it's brilliant, right? Yeah. Uh, so they actually did a protest outside Twitter headquarters because they were helping, they were saying that Twitter was helping with a conspiracy because their logo is a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so Elon took it to heart because, you know. Right, right. That's why he got rid of Twitter. I, I, I don't know, maybe. Okay, so with that, let's call it a wrap. Thanks so much for joining me today. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you in real life. In, in Great. Sin Thanks, Rob. It was tons of fun talking to you. See you there. Thank you.